You're listening to Economics Detective Radio. Returning to the podcast is Vincent Galoso of Texas Tech University. Vincent, welcome back to Economics Detective Radio. It's a pleasure to be here, Garrett. So our topic for today is anthropometric history. Uh, So Vincent, start by telling us exactly what anthropometric history is. So anthropometric history is something that was that was really started uh, in the 1970s by Emmanuel Roy-Lazuri and then dramatically expanded by by Robert Fogel, who ended up in part winning his Nobel in economics for uh, his work uh, on that topic. And the idea behind anthropometric history is to study uh, the importance of t- to have a multidimensional approach to living standards. So living standards are not only... GDP per capita. They're not only uh, real wages. Uh, it's it goes a little deeper into aspects of uh, the physical quality of life. And anthropometric history is this uh, in, in like in, in a cheap word, it would be presented as the biological standard of living, uh, which is what anthropometric history is trying to do. And generally. Uh, The main focus has been on uh, causes of mortality, on nutrition, on life expectancy. But the most important variable uh, studied in anthropometric history is uh, the heights of uh, a population uh, because it is an incredible proxy for uh, all these other aspects of nutritional, of of the biological standard of living. Right. And... The nice thing about heights is that they go they go back a long way, right? So before we have, you know, we only have GDP per capita going back uh, 100 150 years. We only have uh, if we if you wanted to look at the the homes people lived in, we have those going back a couple thousand years. If we want actual documents doc- documenting people's wages or stuff, you know, again, it's you, know, you can maybe get some going back uh, to the Roman era or, or something. But heights, you know, we have human remains and we can look at them going back even to prehistory. We can look at them going back, you know, 100,000 years, although, of course, there aren't too many preserved fossils from that time. There are no written documents. So it's, it's, it's nice because it, it not only, you know, makes our view of recent history more rich, but it also extends our view of history back further into the past yeah actually if you uh, if you go on uh, for example uh our world uh in data.org uh they've actually compiled there some of the archaeological work that studies the skeletal remains of people uh who were also the skeletal remains that were found uh and how tall there would have been uh, based on skeletons and recomposition of these skeletons. And uh, we can go as far back as uh, eight millennia before uh, the uh, the birth of Christ. So basically uh, 8,000 years before our age, which basically brings us, and we can have very strong data on this, uh, so up to the beginning of the Neolithic age. And uh, we can even find uh, stuff that goes uh, – many, many more hundreds, thousands of years, in fact, before that point. Uh, and what you end up seeing is that although there is a lot of uncertainty, like it's not perfect data, uh, and it's, a, it's an incredibly hard data to use, is that there is no trend in human stature up to the beginning of the 1800 when there is a break apart where we start seeing a hockey curve in a certain way. So not like the... Uh, CO2 hockey curve, but the human sta- human standards of living hockey curve, where you see GDP per capita going up, but uh, simultaneous to that increase, we start seeing the long run increase of uh, the stature of people. And the reason why that's interesting is that uh, stature is heavily related to to your biological standard of living. It will be in part affected by genetics, but in the long run, because your genetics is affected by your environment and your early con- social socioeconomic conditions in life, uh, the longer time passes, the more you will see a correlation between long-term 
uh, measurements of stature and uh, GDP per capita and measures of material living standards. And the other reason why it's interesting is because you will find, especially from the work of Robert Fogel, that uh, height is actually a very well, a very strong predictor of uh, your risks of mortality at any given point in time. So unless like you're freakishly tall, uh, where it would be uh, an abnormal disease, your relatively tall people generally will have lower risks of uh, mortality at any year in their lives relative to uh, shorter individuals. Uh, and the reason for that is that uh, a lot of the differences in height, especially within genetic groups, uh, comes a lot from uh, early living standards uh, in life, how much access to proteins you have, uh, what was your nutrition, and from there it becomes really easy to see uh, what is your quality of life in, uh, in a health aspect of this quality of life. Yeah, I, I that's very interesting because, you know, if we're using it as, I don't know, if we're referring to just our own experience, there there's we see a range of heights, but Usually, you know, when everyone you know is healthy, the genetic aspect is going to dominate height. But in a population where some people are healthy and some people aren't, then we'll tend to see that the socioeconomic and the nutritional aspect has a stronger role. And so it can be a, a metric for the other things we're interested in. We're interested in standards of living. We're interested in life expectancy. So... Your paper, uh, it contributes specifically to the literature on people's heights in the 18th and 19th century. During that period, there are differences between the old and new world and between populations within the old and new world. And also, there, there, is a, there are different trends in those different populations. So tell me a little bit about the background for your paper and, and that literature in general. Okay, so the main piece of background on in my paper is that there's this puzzle. So there's uh, this puzzle that's really annoying for economic historians is uh, what we call the antebellum puzzle. So to refer uh, to the period just before the Civil War from 1861 to 1865, where in the United States, there is a decline in stature and in heights, basically, that's combined with rising mortality. And that comes in at the same time that the United States are growing incredibly rich, uh, so rich that by the, the beginning of the Civil War, they overtake uh, Britain uh, in terms of living standards. And that's even accounting for uh, slavery. So we're dividing not over just uh, free white individuals, we're dividing uh, incomes over the entire population, which is a very strong uh, statement, nothing about the normative aspects of slavery, but even, uh, for example, in the United States at that time, it was, incredibly, uh, it was an incredibly rich country. And this decline in heights is uh, particularly interesting uh, because it is a puzzle. And it is a puzzle in, in two other senses, uh, in the sense that while countries like England experience the same contradiction where living standards in material terms go up, but this biological living standard goes down. In other countries like uh, France or Sweden, it actually goes in the opposite. The, the two of them go in the same direction. So people are growing richer and they're growing healthier, which makes it the puzzle much more interesting. And the other part of the puzzle, which is really interesting, is that Americans, even if their height, were, their stature was falling throughout the period, were actually exceptionally tall people for uh, that that day and age, uh, Americans were very, very tall. And even black Americans who were slave uh, were incredibly tall, which is something a lot of uh, a lot of people did not expect when this literature started out. But it's been numerous times confirmed where we find that uh, black Americans, slaves and free, were taller than 
black slaves and free uh, from other places in the Americas. So, for example, a Brazilian uh, black slave tended to be shorter than an American black slave. And not only that, but American black slaves tended to be taller than British uh, free whites. So people in England and even more so than uh, French and Italians. This this was actually one of the biggest puzzles that came out. So they're they're having this change where living standards in material terms are going up simultaneously biological living standards are going down but this isn't happening everywhere and it's from a very very exceptionally high level which is makes it even more interesting as an episode and what i try to do in my paper that's coming up in economics and human biology is to bring in canada inside that discussion uh because canada is actually very interesting so you use data from a little bit before the American Civil War. In fact, it's it's a really interesting data set. You have prisoner records from a Quebec prison. So tell me, where did you get access to, to the, the records of prisoner heights? Okay, so that's where you have to thank uh, the Mormons, because uh, Mormons have been incredibly, and this is a little known, like, it's a cute, cute parenthesis to make, but Mormons have been, uh, because of their missionary uh, aspects of uh, of uh, of their group, is they're uh, they're sent out a lot to digitize old genealogical databases uh, that are in books, paper form, and one of the uh, the databases that they ended up digitizing was the uh, prisoner records from Quebec City Prison. And they did an incredible job at it because uh, the files were well coded and uh, were done in uh, conjunction with the National Archives of Quebec. And uh, it was easy for uh, me and uh, Alex and Vadim, who are my co-authors on this one, to simply ask for the data and start uh, coding it in a way that uh, suited itself for statistical analysis. So they uh, they actually provided, uh, by virtue of that stature of prisoners uh, in Quebec City, born between uh, 1760, in fact, and 1835, but uh, we had to restrain our sample to uh, 1820 uh, to 1780. So people born between 1780 to 1830 because we didn't want to have people who are too young so they're not they haven't uh, finished growing or people who are too old because after a certain age there is a slight tendency uh, for heights to drop a little so you grow a little shorter when you're uh, when you're older Uh, so we wanted to keep it in a group of people aged uh, 20 to 50 born between uh, 1780 and 1830. And we were able to create this half-century portrait of the heights of uh, French Canadian admitted to the Quebec City prisons. We also had uh, the heights of ethnically Irish, Scottish, and uh, British individuals. But because we couldn't know where they were born, unlike the French Canadians who were obviously native to Canada, we couldn't isolate uh, their place of birth. So we uh, presented the data for these other three groups, but we didn't go in great depth about uh, what explains the trend and their heights overall. So what do you find for these Quebecois prisoners? And, and second, how does it fit into the, the broader pattern of North America and, and I guess the old world during that period? So what's interesting in that case is that, so the first thing is the French Canadians are today and where as far back as the data before our stuff came in uh, could measure. So the, the latest, the, the earliest we had was uh, mid 19th century stuff. Uh, the French Canadians were known to be incredibly short by North American standards and within Canada, they were exceptionally short, uh, even if uh, they were equally poor as people in the Maritimes and people in the Maritimes were taller than them. So it, it was an oddity in that sense that was very hard to comprehend and to put uh, an idea on. And our question was, did this predate uh, one of our, the fact that one of the questions we asked was, did this predate the, the period at which it started? So is it possible that the French Canadians were short from the very beginning? So rather than being something that we know as a statistical fact from the late 19th century onwards, uh, was it true in the 18th century? What we find is that, yes, French Canadians were short by North American standards. However, by in 
international standards, they were exceptionally tall. So they were taller than uh, their counterparts in France, from uh, which population they hailed. So they uh, bear the greatest uh, genetic similarities uh, with the French, and with the French, they're exceptionally taller. And it's important to note that the data I showed was uh, comparing Canadian prisoners with French soldiers. And that's important because soldiers uh, tend to be closer to the average of the population, while people in prison tend to be self-selected from the lower dredges of society. So they're generally poor individuals, people who have a lower opportunity crime of uh, committing a, a lower opportunity cost of committing a crime. So they're generally smaller than the average. So finding that the shortest in Quebec, so the shortest French Canadians are taller than the average French is saying a lot. And not only that, but when you start comparing them with Latin Americans, they're uh, very, very tall, with the exception of the Argentinian, with whom they seem to be roughly on par. The French Canadians are very, very tall people uh, at that time. And the only people they're shorter than are uh, black slave Americans, white free Americans, and uh, other British North Americans within Canada. So it doesn't, within Canada, they're small, but by international standards, they were incredibly tall. Okay. And also through the period that you study, their heights were falling, correct? Yes. So as I mentioned, like when we had our, our, the, 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 the earlier part about the antebellum puzzle, the antebellum puzzle is a period where you expect the two types of living standards to move in opposite directions. And in the case of Canada, what we find is that there is a, a slight increase in living standards during the period from 1780 to 1830, but that uh, increase is very modest and very uneven. So there's a lot of war shocks that come in, which disturb uh, economic activity. There is uh, a lot of shocks that affect uh, food prices uh, dramatically, so that in that period you find that the French Canadians actually grow shorter. So we're finding uh, some pieces of evidence that the antebellum puzzle uh, could now encompass Canada up to 1820. The problem is that when we started linking up with the other databases from other prisoners from other prisons, and we had Quebec-born people, we found that after 1820, there's this decline that goes up to the people born in the 1820s. But thereafter, height starts to stabilize or maybe increase moderately. And that is at the period when living standards are going up very clearly. So what we find is that Canada may be included inside the antebellum puzzle up to 1820, but after there is a lot of signs that it should not be included. So unlike the United States at that time, we were experiencing rapid economic growth and falling stature, uh, the Canadians are uh, experiencing uh, either stable stature or slightly increasing stature. The French Canadians, they're experiencing experiencing stable or, or, or slightly rising stature, but at the same time, they are experiencing positive economic growth in many other spheres of society. So you're forced to kind of uh, argue that the antebellum puzzle is even more puzzling because a society like Canada, which uh, is very similar to the United States, so it's an economy that we could qualify as a frontier economy where land is abundant, labor is scarce, capital is scarce. Uh, so it has the same uh, deep structural similarities as the United States. It has uh, the same differences as the United States has with uh, the old world. And yet it operates in a different uh, manner, which makes the antebellum puzzle for the United States uh, much harder now to see, uh, because now it's, it, it's, it's even starker. Some place so close, so similar, is yet having a different pattern that we observe. Well, at least the similarity between the period during and right after the American Civil War and the late 1700s, early 1800s in Quebec is that there's a lot of war and conflict. Uh, I believe during that the period you study, there were two wars and multiple in insurrections that affected Quebec. So, so is is war the the pattern, or or is there there is there more to it? Uh, I think there's a mixture of factor coming in. So I think war is a predominant one. And the reason why it would be predominant is that throughout the period, it blocks access to foreign goods uh, to come in from Quebec because they're threatened by uh, insecurity at sea. 
that limits the ability to expand uh, production, but it also limits the consumption of certain goods uh, which would have a positive effect on uh, on health, especially the imports of salt, which permits the conservation of meat uh, for long periods. So that would have had a uh, an important impact. Uh, but the most important one is the fact that the colony actually gets invaded uh, in the late 17, well, in the mid 1770s, uh, when the Americans decide that they want to have Quebec uh, join uh, the nascent United States. Uh, they invade it. Uh, it creates a a, a shock. Uh, and then until 1783, there is a massive wave of British soldiers uh, living in the colony, uh, which has an impact on economic activity and a negative one. And then the other part is uh, in 1812, the Americans actually uh, end up invading again uh, Canada. And this is actually a dramatic shock uh, for that period. Uh, that war, even though it lasts basically one year inside Canada, has dramatic repercussion on living standards, uh, on uh, economic activity. Uh, it, it creates a very big shock to the life of Canadians at that period. So uh, wars are probably the biggest, uh, a big factor, and I wouldn't say biggest, but a big one. Uh, but the thing that matters probably more is the fact that as a frontier economy, eventually there's more people being born, more people migrate, and the uh, relative abundance of uh, factors uh, relative to land start to change. And by definition, it leads to a change in the relative prices of the outputs that they, they, they generate. So uh, goods that used to be, that were very labor intensive become cheaper. So manufactured goods become cheaper as industries developed in Canada, as they start moving away from primary industries. But the problem is that at the same time, goods that used to be cheap because they were land intensive, so meat, grains, uh, start becoming progressively uh, more expensive in relative terms. So that consumption pattern change away from, from meat, uh, from rich from rich sources of calories so that household change what they eat and how much they eat and what they sacrifice for that. So they start consuming more durable goods, but they do sacrifice on a little on the quantity, but largely on the quality of the foods they consume. And that leads to a large contributing factor inside the decline of heights uh, during that period. Okay. So th I guess the there's some sort of qualifiers you, you talked about the genetic connection with the french in france and and so that sort of controls for the genetic aspect on the other hand quebec is very very cold and you have very cold winters and so presumably you need to eat more to to get the same sort of level of of health uh how, how does that play into it so that was this it, this is not a problem in everything that's anthropometric it's very hard to control for if you could find an ideal data set it would give you the city a person's in and how much access he has to transportation network uh so you can control for the disease environment so how exposed to disease risks and epidemics a person is, uh, how much he has to consume uh, to keep his uh, basic metabolical rate uh, constant. So the rate at which you, you keep your weight constant, uh, you could control for that. It requires a lot of data, and it's very rare that you have a data set that does all that at once uh, in anthropometric history. So you're forced often to try and isolate one in particular so you can make a list of which matter which in, uh, which matter more in general. And in the case of Canada, the difference in calories probably offsets uh, the disadvantage uh, that the French that they so they have an, they have a disadvantage there. But because there were a less urbanized economy than the French, they also have a lesser disease environment. So that plus that gives them an advantage on the disease environment relative to the urbanized French comes with a disadvantage where Canada is so well, so cold, so very, very cold that uh, more meat, more calories have uh, to be ingested to maintain a constant, not the same nutritional status as uh, someone in France. So it's kind of a wash on this one. Okay, so so there are different factors affecting the old world and the new, and they they sort of cancel out. And of course, they would be um, what we'd think of as fixed effects. So obviously, when we see a trend, 
we can't attribute it to something that was there all along. In your paper, you you link this with uh, some evidence from infant mortality. So uh, that that seems to have been correlated with the the fallen heights. Yes, actually, this is very important uh, because there's something called the Baker hypothesis, and the Baker hypothesis is that the living standards of your mother, while your inner womb, uh, will have a very large impact on uh, your early development and on uh, your height, on your health. So it's an incredibly important factor. So when you find that uh, infant mortality increases, especially if it's uh, early neonatal mortality, so mortality within the seven days after birth, uh, generally they're related to the quality. So it's weird to say, but the quality of the pregnancy. In that situation, when you see rising infant mortality with uh, declining stature, you're seeing a sign that is consistent uh, because the two should, by our understanding of maternal health and early maternal health and general health uh, in infancy, should move together generally. Uh, if they start moving differently, then you might have problems in your data or there might be other confounding factors, but it is something that's very important. And that's why, for example, in the antebellum puzzle for the United States, one of the things that's often noted is that heights fall, but mortality risks seem to increase. And in that period, there are not very strong improvements uh, in life expectancy. Oh, okay. So... Yeah, I I heard about in a, a different context. Uh, there was a study where uh, they looked at a famine, and people whose mothers were pregnant during the famine were much more likely to be to grow up to be obese than people who whose mothers grew up, you know, immediate in the time periods before and after the famine. So, so there, you know, there seems to be strong evidence that your mother's health or, or factors affecting her while she's pregnant with you affect your your health uh, w once you yeah. become an adult. Yeah, with the antebellum puzzle, with the heights falling well, infant mortalities stay up, or I mean, stay low. I, I guess it is looking more and more like, like height is just an anomaly, and that maybe something other than standards of living are affecting it uh, in, in the in the antebellum period. Uh, is that is that yeah. sort of the the conclusion people are are working towards? Yeah. So here is where so we there's this broad agreement on well not broad. So let me just like there is one point of disagreement that comes in this debate over height, and then we can start like so there's there's one point of debate over the trends themselves, and then there is a, a set of uh, debated propositions over the interpretation that this has in terms of broadly defined living standards, but also in terms of what it tells us about institutions, and which is why I got involved in that debate, what it tells us about institutions. So the one point that, of debate that comes in is that we have weird problems with our data sets in the sense that the people who will get reported kind of have an endogenous selection bias. So a good example would be basketball play. Basketball players are uh, very tall people, but they've grown tall. The average basketball player has grown taller faster than the average uh, person. And the reason for that is, is, is simple. In highly competitive sports, where very small changes at the margin will have dramatic impact on uh, competition, uh, you try to push that factor more and more. So you find that, yeah, uh, people in basketball uh, in 1950 used to be 79 inches tall and uh, as opposed to 69 inches for the general population in the U.S. And uh, right now, by eight, 1980, those born in uh, 1980 uh, who now play, uh, their height is now 81 inches as opposed to 70.5 for the general population. So it gives you uh, a dramatic difference uh, in terms of who selects inside the sample you measure. So if I was to take a sample of basketball player 
I not won't I not only would have a, a group that is at any given time taller, but there might be a time factor that comes in where over time the tallest start to self-select within that group. So this endogenous selection bias is a big deal in the literature. And one of the arguments that's been advanced about the antebellum puzzle, and it's been advanced by uh, Howard Bodenhorn, who's got something coming up in the Journal of Economic History, is he takes, he points out that prisoners who would have committed crime uh, in early America were people who were exceptionally short uh, because uh, as people were growing richer, the opportunity cost of committing a crime was increasing. And by definition, you are left with those with a greater and greater proportion of people whose opportunity crime of opportunity cost of crime is smaller. So you would have people who tend to be smaller enter the sample in greater and greater proportion, even if at any given time, these people would actually be growing a little taller. Same thing with soldiers. So they point out that uh, the very tallest are also people who are uh, very rich. So the very tall people who are very rich people will not join the army. So they are not. They do not enter our samples. And when they, uh, when Bodenhorn attempted to correct for this endogenous selection bias, he finds that there is uh, there is no antebellum puzzle in the U.S. This is highly debated. The idea, the methods he uses to test this have been found to be moderately convincing enough that it is uh, it has forced some of us to return our position but there's more recent work that came up from uh, Zimran out of the University of out of Northwestern who made better controls than Bodenhorn and found that there is still an antebellum puzzle but it is much 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 smaller than uh, we were initially led to believe once you account for endogenous selection bias so there is still there is still a possibility that there is a modest phenomenon known as the antebellum puzzle which uh, goes with declining stature, but it's pretty clear that there is, even if there is a selection bias uh, for high spirit from the United States, there is an increase in infant mortality, there is an increase in mortality risks, uh, which uh, comes at the same time as uh, up to 1860. So most largely between 1830 and 1860, these increases in mortality risks. Okay, so when you when you have this selection issue as well, it could turn into an inequality story rather than an average standard of living story. Uh, do people think about that? Yes. Yeah, so inequality has started to weigh in very heavily in that debate because it's along with GDP per capita, uh, one of the strong predictors of changes uh, in heights. And the reason is, is that uh, we're not talking about inequality today, where someone in the bottom 20% of Canada is poor, where we could say that, uh, but he's not facing any form of material deprivation that is as extreme as someone who was in the bottom 10% of the population of the United States and let's say 1810. So it is a different phenomenon where inequality, and this I debate some of my colleagues a little on this, we use inequality in that debate for the antebellum puzzle as uh, a, a weird measure of extreme poverty, uh, which would be extreme privation rather than uh, differences in in wealth above a subsistence line. So we're talking about people who are, we're trying to use it as uh, a measure of people well below basic substance. Uh, and that's where inequality comes in. Uh, it's hard. It, it, it's hard to factor it in because there is so much to say about inequality. But on that front, that's that's how I see it when people include the inequality stats. Have people looked at the change in the the, the heights and the the living standards and of the former slaves? Because of course, you know, the end of the institution of slavery, one one would think that would have an impact. So. Could the change be driven by changes within the slave population or the former slave population? So first of all, I should know, and I don't, unfortunately, I should know that what happens to the heights of former slave after the Civil War 
But uh, I'm sorry on this one. I'm I would be talking out of my hat uh, if uh, if I said anything on this. What we know is that uh, Black Americans were exceptionally tall before emancipation. Uh, they were taller than other Blacks in the Americas. Uh, they were exceptionally taller than uh, other individuals uh, as free whites in Europe, and they were roughly equal in height to white Americans who were free, uh, which is very a very strong indictment in terms of how much the institution might have hurt uh, hurt them. But it makes some sense in the sense that, that the tasks they were asked to do were so physically demanding uh, that uh, nutrition had to be very rich for them to be able to do these tasks. And the second is the fact that uh, slaves were in assets in the United States back in those days. So uh, employers had virtue. So employers. Oh, my God, I sound terrible when I say <laughs> no. that. But yes. owners. owners. Uh, it's always hard when you're trying to do positive analysis of slavery, when it's such a normative issue. And then you start using positive words in a debate that is highly normative. It's always ends up a little being a little weird. But since they were in assets to owners, owners had actually a good incentive to make sure that they were in good health. Uh, so you look, for example, actually people who just watch for uh, just to get an image of this, uh, watch 12 Years a Slave, uh, where uh, inside the, the, uh, the merchant house where they're being sold, uh, there's actually like a lot being said, look at how healthy he is, look at how in great shape he is, uh, look at those hips, look at those legs, look at uh, how well fed he's been. So because they were in assets at that time, especially in assets that you could not import more uh, from uh, from Africa after uh, after the American Revolution, it meant that they were better treated in that very specific regard, uh, which made them uh, exceptionally tall, taller than uh, their counterparts on plantations in the Caribbean or in uh, Brazil and in other places in uh, Latin America where the uh, they would have been much better much much worse less treated but that is beyond that it's hard to say anything for me on uh, the issue of slavery because I, I haven't studied uh, dramatically what happens after 1865 for the US yeah well, and it's not as interesting for me yeah um, well the, I guess to add to the the bit about slaves in the Caribbean and Brazil the big difference there is just the distance to West Africa where where the slaves came from and and the the huge cost and risk of traveling so there may have been selection effects uh, there was a lot higher mortality bringing slaves from West Africa to North America than there was bringing them to much closer Brazil and so it may have been that the the least healthy just tended to die en route and so it could be yes. you know genetic selection and also just that when you know slaves as an asset if they're very hard to replace which they are in North America then you want to invest more in any given one Whereas in Brazil, where they're cheaper to replace, you maybe work them to death and then get more, as terrible as it is. Yes. Actually, you're, 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 you're putting your finger on something that, that has actually interested me in this debate, uh, that's been actually very crucial uh, in that debate over the antebellum puzzle. Uh, it's the role of institution. So you've mentioned, for example, that there is selection effect in within the effect of uh, the diff the distance between Brazil and West Africa and West Africa and the Caribbean and then the Caribbean and uh, West Africa and the United States, whereby the longer the trip, the greater the mortality rate and uh, the early the, the the ones who die the earliest are the ones who are the least in good shape. So by definition, you have a greater popul a greater population of people in bad shape in Brazil relative to people in the US in terms of slavery. But uh, the counter side of that is that there were still differences in the institution of slavery. The institution of slavery uh, in the Caribbean was dramatically different than the one in the United States, especially after the 1770s, so after the American Revolutionary War. And uh, these small differences in institutions led to a very, very important difference in the biological standard of living. And that's where the biological standard of living is very interesting. It, it, it tells a story about institutions. So when uh, the great 
cities start peopling up, peopling up as uh, more people decide to move there, as there is economic expansion, the institutions that are in cities at that time uh, that govern uh, that the governance of the provision of public goods, of private goods in cities, will tell you a story of industrialization. So uh, the fact that, uh, so in the question, for example, when we said France and England had the uh, did, uh, had different antebellum puzzle where France didn't have this and the United States had the puzzle. Uh, it could be a story of what institutions are there in city that govern public health relative to the United States. It tells you a story of all these little things that are not necessarily monetary in terms of living standards, but that will matter to people. And it becomes interesting to ask all these questions about institutions. So what governed meat markets? Uh, was there something that prevented the emergence of private hospitals or something that uh, uh, made it hard for people to invest in certain types of public goods? Or was there some rent seeking? And in these little differences within these time windows, it becomes interesting to study the role of institutions because of that puzzle. And that puzzle is probably the most, the greatest thing that the, the main reason I wanted to jump in that literature is that we can use it to study institutions. My guest today has been Vincent Galoso. Vincent, thanks for being part of Economics Detective Radio. It's a pleasure. 